Hello everyone, how are you going? Welcome to 7 Things I Wish I Knew Before Moving to Canada. Now obviously every country is going to have their own little nuance thing that might catch you by surprise, so let's see what Canada has on offer. I'm Stephen and today we are going to be talking about the 7 things I wish I knew before moving to Canada, including a pretty massive one that could end up saving you months of time on your work holiday permit. Wow. All of these things would have made life a lot less stressful and less expensive. So if you are thinking of making the move yourself or moving to anywhere else in the world, to be honest, then hopefully this list can save you from making the same mistakes I made and in doing so, save you some dollar bills. Yeah. We are also going to be tallying up an estimate to show you how much time and money could have been saved if I oh. knew these things in advance. And we'll put this nice little visual up here for you folks so we can all see in painful 4K detail oh. just how big these numbers get. Well then, that will certainly be interesting to see because obviously someone can sit there and go, oh, I just hate this part, but it doesn't really affect me that much or I just, this was different, whatever it may be. But when you actually tally it up into time, money, and I guess hassle tax involved as well, really, it can certainly stack up pretty darn quickly. And so we'll see how they actually break it down because I can only imagine some things are going to be subjective, some things can be objective, and money's just money. Tip one subscriptions and digital accounts. We what? are all living our lives in the subscription model these days. From Netflix to HelloFresh, and now it seems like iPhones as well. Well, let me tell you <laughs> something. If you move to a different country, you might find it extremely difficult to cancel your subscription plan or even to switch your plan to avail the local currency rates. Oh. Now, some companies make it easier than others, and obviously I can't speak on every subscription model in the world because, well, that would be impossible. Absolutely. Think about all the ones that just pertain to your country and then you think basically every country but are a few of the main like global ones are going to have their own version of that thing. Like you said you have food delivery, video content, audio content, so many different things. Some people's houses even run on a subscription for goodness sake and so yeah I certainly would want to make sure you got all your ducks in a row before changing too many things over or not. But some of the hoops you have to jump through to cancel or change your account is borderline insanity. I spent three hours on live chat with Apple Customer Care. Three hours. Right. Trying to get them to change my location to Canada so that I could use the Canadian App Store. And in the end, the customer service rep said that they couldn't do the switch because I still had a live subscription for Apple TV on my account. <laughs> which I had gotten for free when I bought my laptop last year. And they said that I couldn't even cancel. Wow. Full disclosure, I did get another Apple Live Chat oh, support person a day later, and they did manage to cancel my free <laughs> subscription and oh. switch me to Canada with relative ease. There we go. I was gonna say, surely that is ridiculous. That has to be a very easy fix. And so there's no way they just go, no, sorry, it can't be done. I mean, my favorite part about the whole thing was the fact that he got the entire thing for free in the first place. It's not like something he absolutely relied on that he went out of his way to get. No, it was just something that was given to him and that was the thing that was stuffing the rest of the process up. But the other thing that caught me off guard is the fact he said there is different app stores per country. I've never even heard of the thing, let alone run into that problem. And I don't even understand why it's separated in the first place. How is that going to be considered better? I mean, I can understand him talking about maybe an individual app like Netflix Canada, but that would surely be handled by the app, not the entire app store. And so I'm a little bit confused as to what it even means. Like surely I can search up just coming from an Australian app store, whatever that would mean, but surely I can just search on the app store for Toronto's public transport app or something like that. After yet another hour. Oh. So the first tip in this video is to check what subscriptions you have open and ask yourself, do you really want to keep them? Or even can you keep them? if you are going to a different country. Now, some other accounts that you should look at if you're moving are PayPal, Adobe Cloud, Amazon Prime, YouTube Premium, Google Subscriptions. I've just realized I might have too many subscriptions. <laughs> Yeah, that is a lot more than I could ever just come up with. Surely PayPal doesn't have a subscription. Is that just talking about like geolocation or is he actually talking about a subscription that they offer? And I can also understand letting someone like Amazon Prime know so they don't deliver it to the completely wrong address or something like that, let alone Adobe being mixed in there. I mean, I understand that it is a subscription, but at the same time, surely it makes no difference based on what country you are in. Tip number two, references from your landlord and work. Right. Okay. So number two is all about the pre-planning. 
you're getting ahead of some problems. Like I've said in my other videos, if you are moving over, I strongly recommend looking into an Airbnb. Sooner or later though, you are going to be looking for long-term accommodation. When that happens, you'll be asked for references from your landlord in your home country and maybe even a work reference as well. Get these ahead of moving over and you can whip out these documents on request, thus significantly speeding up the whole process of finding somewhere to live. Well, that is a complete shock to me because I've never heard of someone needing a reference, let alone actually going through and getting it with their previous landlord. I mean, most people don't exactly like their landlord and usually it is because of multiple factors, but it always boils down to not having the greatest relationship with them. But none of that changes the fact that I've never heard someone say, oh, I just got rejected because I needed to whip out a reference and I didn't have one. I've never even heard of that. I mean, I guess I can understand why a landlord might want such a thing, especially to feel a little bit more secure within their entire investment it's not going to get burnt down or beaten up but he also said you might want references from your place of work and so that's just being ridiculous how many different references do you need and honestly if you're not working and you've never lived in a place before how are you ever going to get one if that is a general requirement and so feel free to let me know how stringent and how strict they can be with this entire application process and even if it's something that does happen in Australia and I've never heard about it let me know about that as well because I've never heard of such a thing tip number three unlock your mobile cell device oh. Imagine. Mobile phone plans in Canada are notoriously expensive. Now, one of the simplest ways to save some money on your phone plan is bring your own device. That right. does mean, though, that before you land in Canada, you should make sure that your mobile phone is unlocked so it can be used with any provider. This is essential to having access to a far cheaper phone plan option when you land. That is something that I never would have thought of. And I do know that Canadian phone plans are just outrageously expensive, especially compared to Australian plans. I would have assumed that out of the two, we would have had the most expensive plans. But no, I have seen the cost and in the comments, everyone's like posting them. I'm going, my goodness, what is it, 2002 or something? We're getting $100 for two gigs? But regardless, it certainly makes sense that if you bring your own phone, it's going to be a little bit cheaper or a lot cheaper in some circumstances. It's the same thing in Australia, and I can only imagine virtually all around the world. That's how the telcos are making money. They're just putting a little bit of an extra hassle tax on top. And look, I guess for some people it works. They're a lot happier just spending, I don't know, $100 a month instead of paying it outright for two grand or whatever it may be, and then paying $40 a month. Or maybe if it's a business, they're just going to be rolling over phones every couple of years, keeping their entire fleet, if you want to call it that, just a little bit more modern and upgraded and so they just do it that way to maintain that cycle. Either way, I guess it just comes down to the fact that if you already have a phone and if it's not stupidly old and it still works, just probably look at just bringing it over to Canada instead of just going, oh yeah, I'll just get a phone and a plan when I'm there. Tip four, requesting a driving record and getting motor insurance letter from your automobile insurer. Okay, what? you want to drive when you get to Canada. Great. It is a massive country and having a car or even being able to rent a car means you get to see more of it without the hassle of airplanes. Some of the yeah. scenery out here, you don't want to miss these drives. Well, if you plan on getting a car when you land, it can save you a lot of headaches if you request your driving record and bring a letter from your current insurer before coming over, as this can really help save money on your insurance plan. What? Unless you live in BC and you only have one option for motor insurance anyway. Whoa, really? Wow, okay then, that's a news to me either way. But honestly, it's just catching me off guard about how many documents Canada apparently needs from the fact that, okay, if you want to rent somewhere, you need documents. Oh, you want to drive, you also need documents. And not kind of in terms of contract documents, just documents to even prove you're a person kind of documents. I mean, I guess in comparison to housing, this one seemed a little bit less critical. It was more about saving yourself money if possible. But the fact that it's even an option is insane. And to request a driving record and a letter from your insurance company, that just sounds like a headache in itself. And I kind of feel as though that's a shame because it's putting people off driving and seeing incredible scenery like you said and like we're seeing. And so I don't know if it's just me, but the entire process just seems so arbitrary. It just turns the entire thing into a job. You have to do this and this and this and go through so many hoops. I mean, maybe you'd be different compared to traveling there, compared to moving there. But the fact of the matter is that it's clearly an experience and there's a reason for him bringing it up in this video. And so this, with that many hurdles, it just goes, oh, really? I can't be bothered. I'll go somewhere else. Tip five. Ask for tax forms from your employer and close any bank accounts that you don't want. Okay. So this one might not be an issue for many months after you land. But if you've been working in your home country in the year prior to immigrating, at some point you are going to need to submit tax forms. Trying to do all this while in another country and using government websites can be, well, unpleasant. So <laughs> save yourself some hassle and try and get the tax forms from employers before you leave. So you don't have yet another thing to worry about in tax season. 
Now look, even though this one is clearly more documents to fill out, I can definitely give it a pass because it is more so in the line of moving for a more permanent position multiple years at a time. And so I can only assume and realistically hope that if someone is going for a more extended period of time, they are going to have a little bit more knowledge and nous about where they're actually moving to and what's required of them. I mean, I must say I'm a bit confused when he talks about getting the forms from your employer prior to leaving your country. Does that mean the employer that you're hopefully going to get employed from or your current employer when you're living in the previous country? Because either way, it doesn't really make sense to me. Surely the country you were employed in originally doesn't care about anything to do with the tax that you're going to have to deal with. And then if you don't have a job yet, which is the most likely situation, well, you can't get the forms from an employer you don't have. I mean, I guess maybe some people are moving because of business and they're staying with their own company, but surely that's a very slim margin. And so look, I can fully get behind the idea of trying to get as much organized as you possibly can before you do any kind of move, especially a move internationally that big for multiple years, but I just do not see and understand how realistic that could possibly be. Also, bank accounts cost money. So maybe have a think if you should close your bank account or if you're willing to keep some money in it to pay the annual charges while it's sitting idle. Tip six. What? Wait, does he mean, oh, wait, well, I'm confused now. Is he talking about Canadian bank accounts or just general bank accounts? And you're talking about your previous bank account? Or what is he talking about? I can only assume he's talking about your previous bank. So your non-Canadian bank closing that. So it's not just racking up a cost while it's sitting there doing nothing. And look, that does make sense. I mean, you can get bank accounts in Australia, at least that are zero fees, just all year long, no worries. But if you don't have something like that and your bank account is just going to be sitting idle while you also have a Canadian bank or you're not able to use your original bank, oh, yeah, by all means, just save yourself some money surely tip six when to activate your IEC so oh. the length of time you get on your IEC is dependent on your country of application for me it was up to two years provided what? all the other conditions regarding insurance and passport being in date were met but did you know that you did not have to activate your IEC when you land setting yourself up in a new country can take time finding a place to live getting a feel for the city, what kind of jobs are out there, all that kind of stuff. So if you wanted to make the most out of the time on your work permit, then you could enter Canada as a tourist. Wait until you've yeah, gotten right. a bit more settled before you activate your IEC, which yeah, 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 would yeah. then require you to flagpole. More on that in a later video. Now, obviously there are drawbacks to this. It means you're not legally allowed to work or get a SIN, which can also impact your ability to get a bank account or a phone plan. But I didn't start working or making money in Canada for the first two months which means I burned through two months of time on my IEC not really doing anything with it. So just oh, okay. keep it in mind before you fly over. Yeah, that is certainly some good advice. And like you said, it's just something to keep in mind. It's not a, okay, do this or do that. It's like, okay, if you are immediately able to work, chuck it out there, start earning money. But if you know you're going to be traveling around as a tourist for, let's say, two months like he did, then just don't activate it for an extended period of time. If nothing else, you're just able to buy yourself more and more time. And I can only assume the reason someone would have gone there, especially to move there, is to go there for as long as possible. And I'm not sure how the system works, but maybe some people would be able to work it to their favor so they're getting paid in cash and they don't need to set up a bank account and have all these other things for the first two months. They can have just a tiny bit of income on the side. You know, they'd go do a odd job or whatever it may be around the country. Either way, it is certainly a good thing to keep in mind just to make it all work for you as smoothly as possible. Tip number seven, packing advice. Packing ah, advice. what to pack? Look, I can sit here and tell you to bring X, Y, and Z, but what's the point? We all have different needs and are gonna bring different things with us. I brought two suitcases. One right. was full of clothes that I kind of just threw in with no real thought. <laughs> and the other was packed, like packed full of camera gear. But I know you right. people, you want some real hard hitting, no nonsense advice. Well fine, my one piece of advice is, if you are coming to Canada, bring a rain jacket. <laughs> I thought I could just pick one up over here when I landed and save myself some space in my suitcase. Right. Rain jackets here are expensive, and I can only assume that everyone is living in crippling debt to be able to afford one. <laughs> also, be careful about bringing electronics that will take up loads of space, but might not actually work here. All of the 110, 115, 220, 240, 230, to whatever, there's a million different voltages in the world and everyone is just running on their own thing. But that can make it a little bit dangerous to be bringing things internationally where you don't really need them because they're not even gonna work or they might even just blow up in your face if you're really unlucky. I mean, at least things like phones and all those transformers, you can see it, it will say like 110 to 260 volts, like outside the range of everyone's voltages. So at least it's fine in that regard. And of course, like you said, everyone's situation is gonna be so different 
happens, some people are going to move to Canada, I'm sure with a shipping container, and he moved there with two suitcases, one of which was just tech. And look, I don't super blame him because you definitely want to take away your expensive stuff, but it's also interesting about the rain jackets being so expensive. I mean, I guess in Australia, rain jackets aren't super cheap, or that's a perception I have of them. You can get some cheap ones, you know, you get a poncho or something, but in terms of getting a Gore-Tex style jacket, I guess they would be quite expensive, but maybe they're actually quite cheap in comparison to a lot of the world. I don't know. Either way, considering I've heard multiple times that people live in Vancouver and then you're dealing with the snow and the sleet and I guess water in a lot of different forms, you probably are going to want a rain jacket and some form of other jacket if they are so expensive. I mean, once again, I am caught in two minds because it feels obvious. Surely if you are moving to Canada, as the title suggests, then you're going to be bringing a lot of stuff that you already have. But if you are just touring or just being a tourist, then I can also understand that you might get caught off guard going, oh, I just expected to be able to buy a brand new jacket. That's what I was going to get, but they're so expensive. Why would I ever do that? But hey, I guess if there is a single ray of sunshine, apparently not when you're wearing a rain jacket, but if there is a single ray of sunshine, at least he did not mention that you have to get a reference just to buy a rain jacket. Also, be careful about bringing electronics that will take up loads of space, but might not actually work here. Mm. Like my partner was gonna bring a Dyson hairdryer with her, and those things ain't cheap. Yeah. But what's even not cheaper, less cheap, more expensive is wasting valuable luggage space on electronics that won't work in North America because nice. of voltage issues. All joking aside, if you can afford it, I strongly encourage you to bring the things that are important to you. If you have a pair of football boots that you love, bring them. Maybe you have a stationary hobby and you have pens and journals that you hate to part with, but they're really heavy altogether. Just take them with you. Bring the things <laughs> that mean something to you and don't compromise on them. Because at the end of the day, when you're sitting in your new home in your adopted country, you still want to have the things that are important to you close by. Yeah. That is it from me, folks. As we can see, I could have saved myself a lot of time, energy, and money yeah. had I known these things in advance. And look, that is what I love about watching all these different perspectives. People have so many different experiences with the same country, with the same experience, but in their own way, that you just get so much knowledge. You go, this person said to do this, this person said to not do this. And you just end up having such a holistic view of the country, and you kind of know what you're going into, which can be a lot more comforting, you know? Because regardless of whether the country you're moving to is deemed to be safe or unsafe, or the suburb and the town is just accepting, or whatever it may be, like he said, being able to bring the things that do mean the most to you, bringing those experiences with you so you do retain a little bit of home so you don't feel like a complete outcast in your own house, because I'm sure that there would be plenty of that on its own. You know, you're living in a completely different country, it is brand new to you, everything is going to be in kind of an overwhelming experience in some ways, and so if you can, just add as many things as possible to your arsenal, be it forms and boring things like that, or even just documents that you've brought from home, like you said, boots that you just really love, whatever it may be, it might cost you a little bit of money, it might cost you a little bit of time and some things might save you time and save you money. Either way, everyone's just trying to have the best experience they can and hey, more knowledge is more power. But anyway, in saying that, I reckon I'm going to call it there. So thank you for watching this video. If you did enjoy it, feel free to do the YouTube algorithmic things down below. Also, if this is the first video of mine that you are watching, then make sure to go check out any other ones I've done. Also, make sure to go check out the original video down in the description below. Or hey, maybe even just want to consider subscribing so that you don't miss another one of these in the future. But all in all, have a good one and see ya.